The strategic competition between China and the West has gotten so bad that even China is no longer pretending that there's any hope for reconciliation. This week, President Xi Jinping, in a major speech, accused the West, led by the U.S., of implementing containment, encirclement, and suppression of China that was bringing unprecedented severe challenges to China's development. Which side will emerge victorious from this rivalry is still far from certain, but both sides know that building dependable alliances will be crucial to their long-term success. This is why the U.S. is rebuilding its footprint across the Indo-Pacific region. This is why China is gravitating towards the global south and unwilling to give up on Russia. Some countries are forced to choose sides even if it doesn't serve their strategic interest. Good examples are American allies like Japan and South Korea that are hugely dependent on China for their exports. But a small number of countries have the luxury of not having to choose given their strategic importance. India is one such country. Both the U.S. and China are courting India, as both realize that India could tilt the power struggle between them. Ironically, this means India not only won't have to choose, but could in fact profit by playing both sides. This makes India's strong geopolitical position the envy of other countries. Will India make the most of this once-in-a-generation opportunity? What could possibly go wrong? Should you be investing your money in India now? Hi, I'm David Wu, a former Wall Street strategist with a 20-year track record of making actionable predictions about major global change. Welcome to The Money Game, where I take on groupthink, propaganda, and conspiracy theories in my critical analysis of markets, economics, and politics. Before we begin, please hit subscribe and the bell button so that you'll be notified when a new video comes out. Big is beautiful these days. Last year, India overtook China as the most populous country in the world. In terms of the size of its economy, India surpassed the UK to move up to fifth place in the world, just behind Germany. Big means both the US and China are competing to be its most important trading partner. In the case of the U.S., Washington now sees India as such a crucial piece of its China containment policy that the Biden administration has been willing to turn a blind eye to India's neutrality in the Russia-Ukraine war. Indeed, Washington has placed India at the center of its strategy to detach the global supply chains from China. American businesses are getting the message. In the last financial year, India attracted its highest ever foreign direct investment inflows of approximately 83 billion US dollars. Nearly 20% of the inflows came from the US, second only to Singapore. India is ranked number one by the US News and World Report for having the lowest manufacturing cost ahead of China, Vietnam, Thailand, and Mexico. But India has more to offer than just cheap labor. India's ranked 23rd place for business efficiency in 2022 by the Institute for Management Development, behind China at 15, but basically tied with Germany and ahead of the UK and France. This impressive result is a testament of India's entrepreneurial and management culture. Some say Indian business acumen has no competition. Whether this is true or not, it is consistent with the fact that presently 26 of S&P 500 companies, including companies as diverse as Microsoft, Google, FedEx, and Starbucks, have Indian origin CEOs, with the majority of them born and raised in India. India's cheap labor and entrepreneurial tradition are a powerful combination that will no doubt give China a run for its money. India is the largest democracy in the world. However, for many years, it was not clear if being a democracy was helping India grow its economy. Indeed, it was not so long ago that economists debated whether democracy was holding India back or not, and where along India's development curve, the democratic dividend will finally kick in. Over the past 10 years, India's growth gap with China has narrowed considerably. However, this likely had more to do with the authoritarian neoliberalism of Narendra Modi, India's prime minister, than India being a democracy. 
Indeed, India's press freedom ranking fell to 150 last year, the lowest ever according to global media watchdog Reporters Without Borders. Nevertheless, India continues to perform well in international rankings of political rights and civil liberties compared to other developing countries. With increasing political constraints facing Western multinational corporations, this will help India attract foreign capital. Ironic as it may be, the conflict between the US and China, which has been billed as one between democracy and autocracy, would enable India to fully leverage its democratic credential for its economic goals. However, democracy is certainly no guarantee of the quality of government policies or services. The Institute of Management ranks India 46th place in its government efficiency index that includes tax policy and business legislation. This compares unfavorably against China at 29th place, Thailand at 31st place, and Indonesia at 35th place. Corruption is even a bigger problem. Transparency International ranks India in 85th place in its corruption perception ranking, even behind authoritarian regime like China in 65th place and Vietnam in 77th place. Over the past nine years, the Modi government has gone a long way towards improving the ease of doing business in India. The goods and service tax, GST, reform and the reduction of India's corporate tax rate to the OECD average were major steps that boosted India's competitiveness. However, more has to be done for India to mount a serious challenge to China's dominance in global manufacturing. A survey conducted last year by the UK India Business Council of the 10 largest British companies doing business in India, recommends further reduction of unnecessary bureaucracy, simplifying legal and regulatory complexities in taxation, developing world-class IP and infrastructure environments, and enshrining investor protection. Further issues raised include land acquisition difficulties, contract enforcement, and banking lending reforms. Manufacturing needs infrastructure, a lot of infrastructure that includes ports, roads, rail, not to mention a trained workforce. The Institute of Management ranks India in 49th place for infrastructure, behind China in 21st place and barely ahead of Brazil, Indonesia and Turkey. Infrastructure is arguably the biggest challenge facing India if it were to try to replace China as a manufacturing hub. Modi said last week that infrastructure development is the driving force of the country's economy that would help India achieve its target of becoming a developed country by 2047. His government just announced that it will spend $120 billion in the next financial year, an unprecedented 30% increase on ambitious road, port and railway projects. Longer term, to invest more, India needs to save more. India's saving rate was below 30% of GDP in 2021, in contrast to China's saving rate of 45%. The fact that China saves 50% more than India means China can invest 50% more. Of course, India can supplant domestic savings by borrowing more from abroad. But this means that India will have to run a larger current account deficit than what it's been able to do sustainably until now. Also, running a larger current account deficit will require higher real interest rates that could increase the burden of servicing domestic debt and discouraging investments. Surveys of Indian voters have consistently found that Modi is considered as the best prime minister India has ever had since independence. This is no surprise. Modi is a great communicator with a clear national vision, with the ability to connect with the broad spectrum of voters in a very diverse society. This has allowed him to push through fundamental changes, some of them risky, that have transformed the destiny of India despite some mistakes along the way. With a fragmented opposition in his approval rating over 65%, the election in 2024 will be Modi's to lose. Modi is India's biggest asset. Six more years of his leadership will help secure the reforms of the past 10 years and take India on the path of becoming an upper middle income country by the end of the decade. However, the unpredictable international economic and political environment is the greatest source of uncertainty for India. 
To remain successful, Modi, a strategic thinker, will need to continue to navigate through the increasingly treacherous global landscape. The good news for Modi is that he won't have to reinvent the wheel. India's non-alignment policy of the past 70 years has served her well. During the Cold War, India's first Prime Minister, Jawahara Nehru, steered India well clear of the two blocs, despite pressure from Washington. In a famous speech during a U.S. visit, Nehru described India's main foreign policy objective as the pursuit of peace not through alignment with any major power or group of powers, but through an independent approach to each controversial or disputed issue. A global upheaval is on the rise again as the U.S. decides to contain China before it mounts a serious challenge to the American hegemony. Very few countries will be able to shield themselves from the impact of the new Cold War. However, those that don't take sides, or don't have to take sides, will emerge as the real winners. There's a Chinese proverb, when the marsh bird and clam fight, the fisherman stands to benefit. The fact that Modi is well positioned to be the fisherman in the new Cold War is perhaps the most bullish investment thesis for India right now. If you got something out of this program, please hit like and subscribe to my free YouTube channel. If you want to learn more about my investment strategy, come visit us at davidwuunbound.com. Thank you for listening.